Okay, hi, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Flora and Fauna Friday. Today is the last day of Sequoia Ocean Education Science Odyssey campaign this year. And today, Rachel and I are going to talk to you a little bit about watershed ecology, as well as some native uh, flora and fauna species that you can find in a local park here on Vancouver Island on the western coast of Canada. And so to start off today, Rachel is going to talk a little bit about watersheds. Uh, so Rachel, you can take it away now. Okay, guys, so I'm going to talk about watersheds a little bit. So first off, what is a watershed? What makes up a watershed? So a watershed is an area of land which is made up of several bodies of water, like streams, creeks, or rivers, or lakes, and it all drains the water to a common point, like into a lake, an inlet, or even the ocean. So watersheds could be different sizes, and smaller watersheds could be part of larger ones. They're a very important natural resource for us and other living beings because they nourish all sorts of ecosystems and they filter and supply clean water for everybody. So a little question for you guys. When was the last time you used some fresh water for something? Uh, probably today, right? Probably several times today. So for example, this morning, I brushed my teeth with uh, fresh water from my sink. So. Can you guys name some activities that requires fresh water? Drop it down in the chat. We can get talking about that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different watersheds in the Victoria area or capital region district. There's over 300 major watersheds to be exact. So there's quite a lot around here, which we're really lucky because watersheds are really cool and important. Um, so just to show how many watersheds there are, I'm just going to pull share a map with you guys from the CRD. Just bear with me real quick. All right, so if you can see the map in front here, these are all the watersheds of the Victoria area. So all these different colors in here, these are all separate watersheds. So there's quite a lot from what you can see here. Isn't that cool? Um, so because water runs downhill and follows gravity, all these watersheds follow lines of elevation. So for example, let me just zoom in really quick. You can see this is, for example, this is Mount Doug right here. A lot of you guys have probably hiked up Mount Doug or have walked around the park around there or even been to the beach. Um, this is where it is. You can see Mount Doug has, is part of three different watersheds here. So you can see um, all these watersheds follow the lines of elevation and it's all divided up onto the slopes of Mount Doug. That's because water likes to flow downhill. So Mount Doug is divided into three different watersheds there. So that it clearly shows like which way the water wants to flow and it will follow the flow to a creek, out to a lake. And for Douglas Creek watershed, it exits out on Mount Doug Beach. So it's very cool. So this really shows what, why watersheds go the direction they, they do. And um, yeah, very cool. So now that we learned a little bit about what a watershed is, we're going to switch gears and talk about the Gorge Waterway. So to do that, I'm going to show you guys one more map. Real quick here, bear with me while I switch, switch gears real quick. Okay, so this is the map of the Gorge Waterway, just to orient yourselves. This is north, south, uh, west, east, and over on the east here, this is downtown Victoria. Uh, this is Lake West and Portage Inlet on the top left corner, moves all the way down the gorge, 
all the way down to the inner harbor and out to the ocean. So, so this is a map our research team made for an oyster survey that they're working on at the moment. But today, I'm going to show you how, how many watersheds end, end in the Gorge Waterway. So the Gorge Waterway and Portage Inlet is an endpoint for many different watersheds in Victoria. You can see it has Craig Flower Hospital and Colquitt's Creek, or sorry, Colquitt's River ending in Portage Inlet. So this makes the Gorge Waterway very important. Not only like three rivers end up here, you have two more down towards the ocean. You have the Gorge Creek here and Cecilia Creek here. So that's five different watersheds all exiting in one area. That's pretty incredible. And it's also, this is why it's so important to be mindful about what we put down the storm drains and into our watersheds here in Victoria, because chances are it's gonna end up in the Gorge Waterway. And as we can see later on today, there's a lot of different plants and animals that call this waterway home. So now that we learned about water, uh, watersheds and what watersheds are all about and how they flow across the land, we're going to talk about the hydrologic cycle. So I'm going to share a diagram with you guys. Click. Okay, so the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle is another word for it. It's, a, it's an important note that water always moves in a continuous cycle. So this is a good diagram of it. It's from the Delaware Basin Commission and they did a great job of representing what the water cycle looks like as it moves throughout its different phases. So I think a simple way of thinking about it is to picture this. Water evaporates from both the marine and freshwater sources right here. So this is evaporating up into the atmosphere and it turns into gas and it forms water vapor once it reaches the atmosphere because it's very cold up there and it condenses back into liquid. Then the water vapor results in a cloud or cloud formation called condensation. And then it falls back down onto the earth as liquid, as precipitation. So that would be snow, rain, it could also be hail. Um, and then the water gets absorbed back into the land as snow melt or runoff. And it goes into creeks and rivers and stuff like that before it returns to the marine and freshwater environment. So this whole thing that we just described is called the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle. The water cycle is really important because it influences the climate of certain areas. So this means, so climate just means the weather over a long period of time. It does this by influencing temperature and humidity. So in other words, how hot or cool a place is and how much water vapor is in the air. Many people and animals are acclimatized to their environment. They are used to it. So when changes happen, it could be really quite shocking and difficult for certain, certain animals who may have been, not been able to adapt appropriately. For example, there is a change in the overall temperature of aquatic environment. So maybe it's too warm now. And we kind of talked about that yesterday with us with ocean acidification. Or suddenly there is more or less rain in the area with sensitive plants. So there are many ways an ecosystem can change. And I want you guys to keep this in mind as we're, we're going to come back to this idea later. So the next part of this presentation involves a visit to one of our local parks and we're going to observe some flora and fauna. So I'm just going to switch over to the video now. Like that. I've got to stop sharing this with you. Sorry, right, just bear with me. I want to make sure the volume is going to work for you guys.
Let's go. Okay. Here we go. I'll just play this for you guys. So this is a walk that Kayla and I did the other week where we walked around the Gorge Waterway and we went looking for some local uh, flora and fauna. So it was a lot of fun. We saw a lot of cool things. So we're going to talk about it in the next part of this program. So the Gorge Waterway also flows throughout this park that we went to. And the gorge is a narrow estuary that connects Portage Inlet and Victoria Harbor. Remember that watersheds drain into a common point? Well, the gorge is a transition location between freshwater and marine environments. Historically, it was considered an important cultural place for First Nations as a recreational area for Victoria residents. The water quality became severely degraded around the 1940s and beginning in the 1990s, cleanup efforts have helped restore the water quality significantly. The gorge contains valuable habitat, including eelgrass meadows, as you can see on the screen right now, and a significant population of Olympia oysters, which you may have learned about if you joined us yesterday for Bivalve Thursday. So eelgrass meadows are important sources of food and shelter for many marine organisms, as well as acting like a nursery for young fish to grow. These plants help reduce erosion by anchoring sediment and absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Eelgrass is sensitive to water pollution, so it's important to protect the environment it lives in. A brief recap of Olympia oysters. They're the only native species of oyster on our coast. They were once abundant and an important food source for First Nations. However, over harvesting during the gold rush era depleted many populations and have not fully recovered. Olympia oysters are listed as a species of special concern under the species, Canadian Species Act at Risk Act. So the gorge is also a migratory bird sanctuary. Does anyone know what the term migration means? While we were filming portions of this video, we encountered a few different species of birds. So one of these birds was a great blue heron walking along the gorge. These large birds are partial migrants, meaning that they migrate and others do not. They eat fish mostly, but will also eat shrimp, crabs, snakes, and small mammals. They hunt by wading slowly in the water before striking their prey with their beak. Great blue herons have few predators, but other large birds like eagles may attack them occasionally. Great blue herons are really easy to identify. They have long legs, a large body that is goose size or larger. Their feathers are a blue gray in appearance, uh, and they also have a long neck with a black stripe over their eye, and it continues down the back of their head and neck. Often they are found wading in salt or fresh water and staying very still so they don't disturb their prey.
we also saw some Canada geese. These are another large bird that often fly in iconic V formation and make honking sounds. Canada geese normally migrate south for the winter months, but since we have a milder climate, you can often see them throughout the year here. Canada geese are also very easy to identify. They have quite large, they are quite large, have a brown body with black head and neck. They have white cheeks and chin straps and wide black webbed feet. They can be found near lakes, rivers, on lawns, or even farmers' fields. So this next bird probably looks familiar to a lot of you. These are mallard ducks. A male has a glossy green head and a white collar marking on its neck. And females have mostly brown plumage or feathers with a small patch, a small blue patch on their wing. These ducks generally eat insects, vegetation, mollusks, small crustaceans, and even seeds. These are all natural and nutritious foods that they eat out in the wild. And it's good to note that we can feed small amounts of bread to ducks. However, it's not very nutritious. So you would be better off to feed them seeds or chopped up veggies so they can grow and have lots of energy to forage in the wild. So the next bird you're going to see is a type of song sparrow. We're lucky enough to catch a calling. So these guys are fairly common and can be seen year round. It's nice to listen to the birds singing while walking outdoors. Birds often eat insects and small bits of vegetation. Thank you, Rachel. So now we're going to get more into our plant walk. And we're our first plant here is the common snowberry, which is a flowering shrub that's native to North America and grows in a variety of habitats. So it has small flowers that are usually pink or white, and they grow in clusters. And then in the winter months, the plant produces round white berries, which are not edible for most animals, although some birds can eat them. And although uh, First Nations would use the berries to treat sores and burns because of the antimicrobial properties. And we'll be coming up to our next plant, which is a tree, uh, the Western Red Cedar. So the Western Red Cedar is a native coniferous tree. So you'll observe how it has more needle-like leaves than other broad, smooth leaves. And it likes to live in damp, shaded forest areas. So these trees can grow to be 70 meters tall. That's about 230 feet. And they can live for over 1,000 years. They are often referred to as the Tree of Life, and First Nations have a long-standing spiritual relationship with this culturally important species. They use parts of the tree for various activities, 
Uh, the wood is lightweight and rot resistant. It has a natural fungicide called thujapsin. Uh, so it could be used to create canoes, paddles, totem poles, masks, and dishes. And the bark could be used to make baskets and rope. As well, the inner bark is so soft, and so it was used to make clothing and diapers. Um, and these activities also did not require that the tree be cut down necessarily. So First Nations, they, use, they have strategies for harvesting from cedar trees while leaving them standing. And then we're just gonna circle back now to the concept of upstream downstream effects and pollution and runoff. So some of you may have heard the term stormwater runoff, and that refers to precipitation that does not uh, absorb back into the ground. So unfortunately, stormwater runoff can become contaminated uh, by picking up pollution from the roads, like oil and fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. And these chemicals can be damaging to sensitive aquatic species. So as Rachel mentioned before, it's really important to think about uh, what we do on land, but also on the water that could affect other living things that are downstream from us. Uh, now I know fertilizers can be used to help gardens, but they can also cause nutrient loading in aquatic ecosystems leading to algal blooms. And then those deplete oxygen for other animals when they start to break down. So in a moment here, I'm gonna get the audience, all of you, to brainstorm uh, why are healthy watersheds important? How can we respectfully interact with watersheds? And how can we reduce pollution in our local waterways? So I'm actually gonna pause the video here so that we can do a little bit of brainstorming. I'd love to uh, see some of your answers in the chat. You may have to exit out of full screen uh, to access the chat, but we're just gonna take a brief moment to do that. I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second here. Okay, so I would love to uh, read some of your brainstorming ideas about how we can respectfully interact with watersheds. And I forgot to mention before, but there is a bit of a lag between the video uh, live stream. So if you, if you say something in the chat box, we might not see it right away but we're not ignoring them. So I will go back to sharing our video. Just one moment here. Okay, hopefully you can all see the video again. Okay. 
So if you have thoughts later and you just didn't feel like typing them into the chat box, that's okay. You can always contact us uh, by email or you can talk to us on our uh, social media platforms about your ideas. And so moving on, this is a Geary Oak tree. And Geary Oaks are the only native oak tree in Western Canada. So they, you can identify them by their crooked branches, lobed leaves, and they have a gray textured bark. And these trees form a major part of something called a transitional ecosystem. So Gary Oak Meadows grow after a disturbance event, like a forest fire, and then they transition into a coniferous forest. Uh, so one where the trees have needles and cones instead of leaves and flowers. And to preserve Gary Oaks, um, First Nations would use controlled burns to preserve these culturally significant ecosystems. Uh, First Nations would harvest camas bulbs from Gary Oak Meadows as well, and the acorns to be eaten. So camas, uh, common camas, grows in grassy slopes and meadows and is a member of the lily family. The flowers are a deep blue or purple and occasionally white and grouped in five uh, or more, forming a spike shape. So camas uh, have edible bulbs, which are a staple food of coastal First Nations, and they would harvest the bulbs and then steam them in cooking pits for 24 hours or more to make them sweet. And the bulbs could be eaten warm or dried for storage and then eaten in the winter time. So in order to preserve the uh, seasonal harvest of camas bulbs, First Nations would practice the controlled burns and care for the ecosystem each season. This crow found a really nice stick uh, to build a nest with, so we thought we would just observe this common bird. This next plant is a perennial species, so it grows back every year, and it's commonly called sea asparagus. It is a salt tolerant plant that grows on both coasts of North America, and it grows in salt marshes and estuaries uh, like the gorge, and it uses specific adaptations. So it absorbs salt water, and then it removes the salt and stores it in vacuoles at the end of its stems. And so once the vacuoles are full, the uh, stems turn red and fall off, therefore removing excess salt from the plant. And this is edible and sometimes sold in stores and restaurants. Here we have Himalayan blackberry. This is not actually a native plant, but an invasive one. And the big arch there, we can see it has a huge uh, stem and leaves in groups of five. And it grows in huge thickets that can really take over an area, leaving little room for other plants to grow. But it does produce delicious berries. Uh, moving along, we have one native blackberry species in BC, and that is the trailing blackberry. You can see that compared to the invasive Himalayan we just saw, the stem is less thick and the thorns are not as large. The leaves are also in groups of three leaflets instead of five. And the species grows low to the ground. Um, the berries could actually be used as dyes and the leaves were used as a tea by First Nations. And animals also take shelter in the dense patches that cover the ground. So in the distance there, you can see the Gorge Waterway. So we've just done a little loop of the park here. And we have a few more plants to talk about. This is Oregon grape. 
Uh, it can be confused with holly because of the leaves. They both have spiny toothed leaves. Um, however, the Oregon grape uh, leaves turn red or purplish in the winter, which we can kind of see here. And we can also clearly see that Oregon grape has clusters of yellow flowers. The bark is bright yellow inside as well, and First Nations would shred the bark to make a yellow dye for basket materials. And the berries are edible, but they are very tart. Uh, so traditionally, Oregon grape berries would be mixed with other berries like salal uh, to dull the tart flavor. Nitka rose is a species of shrub that's native to Western Canada and can be found along shorelines, meadows, and stream sides. It can be easily identified by the reddish orange rose hips. Uh, they are usually ripe in September and October, so we didn't see any ripe ones when we went. Uh, but of course, there's also pink flowers with five or more petals uh, when the plant is in bloom. And reportedly, there are many uses of this plant by Indigenous peoples, including collecting the hips to make jams, jellies, syrups, and teas. And the hips are high in vitamin C too, apparently. However, if not prepared properly, the seeds in the hips can cause a condition called itchy bum. But the uh, leaves and the stems were also used in cooking and the bark could be boiled uh, to make a cooled tea used as an eye wash. This one here is actually salal, and that's a common evergreen shrub that was a major food source for animals and humans. It also provides shelter for some other species, and pollinators like to collect nectar from the flowers. And indigenous peoples would often harvest the berries and dry them into snacks like fruit leather or cakes. Uh, next, this is Arbutus. Arbutus is a native evergreen tree in Canada uh, that li likes to live in dry, sunny, and rocky habitats. And it has an important role in preventing soil erosion through its stabilizing roots. And these trees are easily identified by their distinctive bark. So they have a pale green uh, and smooth bark when it's fresh and then it becomes a reddish brown color when it's older and it starts peeling away. Um, Arbutus can photosynthesize from their leaves and their bark. And the First Nations would use the bark and the leaves of this tree uh, to make a tea that they use to treat stomach aches, cramps, and colds. Our last plant is Ocean Spray. This is a native shrub uh, that's also referred to as ironwood, and that's because the wood can be hardened uh, by the use of fire. So many First Nations would use this uh, plant to make digging sticks and spears and harpoons, as well as bows and arrows. And then the leaves and the seeds could be eaten as well or used as a poultice for burns and sores. And many pollinator species also use ocean spray for nesting. Sure, that might be an Anna's hummingbird. So if you're in the greater Victoria area, you can also check out the native pollinator meadow in Esquimalt Gorge Park and read more about the native pollinator species there. So we want to say a big thank you to the Gorge Waterway Action Society for sharing some of their photos and also to our sponsors, 
for helping us with our Science Odyssey event online this year. And we're just going to do some uh, closing remarks. And Rachel is going to give us some really fun recommendations if you're interested in uh, going out and finding some plants and birds. So I'll just stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. Okay, okay, guys. So if you're interested in IDing birds or plants in your neighborhood or nearby park, I have some resources that can help you. So the first book I'd like to recommend is uh, Plants of Coastal British Columbia. I'll just put it up for you so you can see. So it's both by Poulter and McKinnon. Um, I find this is a great book, has lots of pictures, and it has a color-coded uh, guide at the top, so you can easily flip to different families if you're out in the field. Uh, yeah, it's a great book. Highly recommend. I have this one at home. I use it all the time when I go camping. It's, uh, it's a good one if you'd like to invest in some uh, ID books. So the next one I have is actually an app. It's called Merlin. That's M-E-R-L-I-N. So this is a free app that you can download straight onto your phone. Um, it's a great bird guide. It even has calls of local birds that you can play right on your phone and it works offline too. So it's, it's downloaded straight on there. It has different regional ID guides. So you can download them separately based on what per, part of the world you're in. So you can explore local birds if you go traveling or maybe you move to a different place, you can just switch out the guides as you go. Uh, just a warning that this app does take up a lot of phone storage, but I'd say it's well worth it if you're really into birding. I use it all the time out in the field or on my walks and it's a great app. Another online resource or electronic resource that I like to do for, I, for bird ID is allaboutbirds.org. It's ran by the Cornell Lab and it's also the same makers of the Merlin app. This website is very easy to use. It's very user, user friendly for bird ID, has lots of pictures. And I really like that it, has, it explains the life histories of each bird that you're looking at. Also has lots of maps and calls for each species. The last one I'm gonna recommend, I'm just gonna share with you because I don't have it, unfortunately. I wish I did, that would be great because uh, it's a great guide. I'll just share it with you just so you can see it. This is the Peterson Field Guide of Birds of Western North America. This is a great guidebook that has multiple illustrations of each species. It shows you what the juvenile plumage looks like, the breeding plumage. It's, um, it's a great book if you want to invest in a paper copy of a bird ID. We'll make sure we can put all these resources down in the description of this video when we post it on our YouTube channel. So you guys can reference it later if you're interested. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, Rachel. Um, so just to finish off our session today, um, I also wanted to let you know that World Oceans Week Victoria is going to come up soon. Uh, so this, uh, this year, World Oceans Week is going to be from Sunday, June 7th to the 13th, and there's actually going to be a trivia event on June 11th. So Sequoia Ocean Education is working with Oceans Network Canada and also the uh, World Wildlife Organization to put on this awesome trivia event. And there are going to be links to the World Oceans Week uh, webpage as well as the social media platforms in the chat. Uh, you can also go directly to those web pages for more information. And wrapping up with our Science Odyssey. So today was the last day of our Science Odyssey campaign this year. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, please consider checking out some of the other videos we have on our YouTube channel and perhaps subscribing. Um, if you want to be entered into our Science Odyssey giveaway contest, uh, we encourage you to look back at the past three days, the presentations, and see if you complete uh, one activity from each of those days and share it with us. Then you can be entered to win a Sequoia prize pack. Uh, 
Or we also encourage you to complete the activities on your own time anyway, because they're super fun and a really great way to learn about your local environment. And if there are any last minute questions, we will just hang out for a couple minutes to see if they pop up in the chat box. And this was our first time doing a live stream presentations this year. So there's also a feedback form in the chat. We would really appreciate it if you could take some time to fill out that feedback form so we know how to navigate the live streaming better. And because we are ending a little bit early today, you can always check out the other Science Odyssey videos. So on Tuesday, we had Sensational Sea Day where we learned about some of the intertidal um, and subtitle species that live in our Salish Sea. And then on Wednesday, we had our amazing algae all around us day where we got to see some local algae species as well as look at uh, some of the human uses for algae and a little experiment uh, video that I tried to do in my kitchen. And then yesterday we had Rachel do a presentation on bivalves and ocean acidification. And she also did an awesome experiment in that presentation as well. And all of the activities that we are talking about, you can access on our webpage, uh, sequeria.org. There's a Science Odyssey tab. You can get all the information you need there. And we really look forward to seeing what you come up with. So a big thank you to everybody who tuned in today. And we have we hope you have a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, guys.